Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger. Brian seems to have been captured by gnomes once again. Those gnomes just keep popping up in his garden. He needs to hire a better denomer. <laughs> I'm told last time you discussed princesses. We did, sort of. Sort of. Well, now we're going to talk about what happens when the princess is not doing her job. <laughs> Looking at you, Ariel. <laughs> um, not actually talking about the Little Mermaid. Unless you want to, Greg. No, I have that's, that's, about it. that's fine. We, we exhausted princesses of that okay. sort last time. Well, then we're going to talk about what, what do we do when the government, of which the princess is a part, um, is not doing its job. What, when a government becomes tyrannical or fails in its covenant duty, what do we do? All right. Well, here is our text for a starting point. Uh, Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead. She arose and destroyed all the seed royal, it was all the male children of the house of David who might uh, claim the throne. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, there's the princess, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord, the temple, six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. So Athaliah at this point becomes a tyrant in the true Greek sense of the word. She is somebody with absolutely no claim to power, who suddenly says, I will be queen, and takes over and eliminates all possible rivals in one fell swoop. Except one, because she missed the uh, princess Jehosheba. Uh, who just happens to be married to the high priest, manages to spirit away the, the baby boy with his nurse and hide them both in the temple, in one of the side chambers, probably one of the upper chambers where no Baal worshiper would have any desire whatsoever to go. So as long as they can keep the number of people who knew about this to a minimum, there might be some relative safety. Uh, Athaliah promoted Baal worship, the temple probably was, for all practical purposes, shut down, and she certainly had no desire to go there. Uh, and so for six years, Jehoiada and Joshua and the nurse raised the baby. Meanwhile, Athaliah was not fun to be around. She was not a nice lady. She was wicked. Uh, the fact that she was a worshiper of Baal already is suggestive. But when she goes down, nobody's bemoaning her, nobody's siding with her. She had alienated apparently just about everybody. She was not the lawful ruler. The lawful ruler was a little boy whose name was Joash. And she was a mass murderer. So there we wait. Verse 4. This is chapter 11 of Second Kings. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him into the house of the Lord, and made a covenant with them, and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord, and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that you shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house, and a third part shall be at the gate of Sur, and a third part at the gate beyond the guard. So shall you keep the watch of the house that it be not broken down. And two parts of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And you shall compass uh, the king round about every man with his weapons in his hands. And he that cometh within the ranges, let him be slain and be with the king as he goeth out and as he cometh in. And the captains over the hundreds did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest commanded. I'm going to stop there. Uh, before we consider exactly what the details are, I, I think it's important that we, we say up front that conspiracy is not a normal way of life for God's people. In the beginning, before the beginning, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit fellowshiped freely, communed openly amongst each other, the Father and the Son had no secrets in the Spirit, nor did the Son and the Spirit go off in a corner and whisper secrets from the Father. There was open and complete fellowship, and that was the fellowship into which 
Adam was invited as a creature and as a servant and as an adopted son of God. And the idea of trying to shut out others is contrary to the idea of love. The first conspiracy in human history was the conspiracy of Adam and Eve with Satan, which was very much an attempt to shut God out of their secret conversation about dethroning God and making themselves Elohim. And, and from that point on, we have two sorts of conspiracies in human history. The most common by far are wicked people who get together with other wicked people to try to get power uh, and wealth. Now, the fact that um, they um, absolutely should not be trusting each other is irrelevant because they each assume they're going to stab the other in the back first, because that's how conspiracies work. Uh, we've talked about conspiracies, I think, in another context, but here, here's a good time to, to revisit a couple ideas. One, conspiracies are real things in human history. People do conspire. Uh, people in high places conspire. People in low places conspire. People on the small people on the playground conspire. Um, <laughs> the idea that that conspiracy thinking is some kind of uh, psychological illness is nonsense. Just hang around the playground long enough, and you will find all about conspiracies and cliques and and we'll do this and not tell so and so. Often it's mom and dad we're not telling. So conspiracies are a real thing. Two, they do have real consequences. The conspiracy of Adam and Eve with Satan altered the apparent course of human history in a very horrible direction. Now, God knew what was coming, but as far as anyone merely human, merely uh, limited in their knowledge could see, wow, something big just happened, something just changed. And you can walk through all the conspiracies recorded in Scripture, the conspiracy of the brothers against Joseph, the conspiracy of Absalom against David, uh, ultimately the conspiracy of uh, the Jewish leaders and Herod and Pilate against Jesus. Uh, we, we keep seeing these things, and yes, they do accomplish things. Third thing we should note, however, is that they always fall apart because people, people being sinners and wanting to be God stab each other in the back on a regular basis. Just a question of how long I can wait safely before I stab you in the back or run off with all the funds or whatever. And so the idea among some conspiracy theorists that conspiracies are these undefeatable, semi-omniscient, semi-omnipotent power groups that rule the world is simply nonsense. Uh, God allows them to exist for a while. God uses them to bring about things in history. And then God judges them, often simply by letting them be sinful and human and tearing each other to pieces. So all of this in the background. But, the, but even this conspiracy, this conspiring, this breathing together, is itself a reflection of the life of God and the Trinity, except it's reflected through the fall. We take it and we corrupt it. God communes in love and purity and truth. We as sinners commune in uh, viciousness, wickedness, and selfishness. Uh, God announces his intentions publicly. We try to keep it all a secret because we think we can get away with more that way. And so having said all this, we now need to know that there is one other type of conspiracy. But because, first. But first. Welcome, Brian. Oh, hi, Brian. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry for my uh, tardiness. I had several chores to attend to right around seven, and my phone is uh, perpetually on silent. So um, no such warnings <laughs> or protestations or text messages made their way to my ears. It was not. It was uh, okay. not whatever kidnapped me that one time. Uh, <laughs> oh, the no, gnomes. Gnomes. Cause that that was our theory was yeah. that you needed gnomes. to not, the, not this time. Sadly. <laughs> Emily invented this concept of denoming. Oh, I didn't I thought, invent which, it. Which I thought was kind of cute. But anyway, well, that's uh, a J.K. Very, Rowling original, actually. I'm a very strong anti gnomian. <laughs> oh. oh, ouch. That was original. We can blame only you for that. <laughs> well, speaking of such things, we are talking about that, about those who would break off God's bands, cut them asunder. And what God's people do have to do sometimes when that happens, when there are conspiracies of darkness, when men enter into conspiracy in shadows and with shadows, 
then what? Well, sometimes God's people have to initiate their own conspiracies. This is not ideal. Christianity is a religion of confession and profession. We're not a secret cult. We don't have secret doctrines. We're not ashamed to tell anybody what the faith is. We write confessions and creeds and publish them. We go on worldwide radio and television and announce the gospel. We send people out to tell the world what we believe. So in that sense, we're, we're not a Gnostic cult. Uh, where, you know, I know something you don't know, but if you, right now for forty nine ninety five, if you say, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let you in on secrets of the universe, we don't do that. But sometimes when the powers of darkness raise a conspiracy against the church, the church has to respond, usually with a fairly passive conspiracy of, let's not worship in public, let's go out in the forest, let's go into the catacombs. Let's uh, meet in somebody's house in the cellar, because we really don't want to die today. Um, and we invent passwords. Remember the the ichthys, the fish, was originally a way of identifying yourself as a believer to other believers. This is not ideal. This is not what Christians want. But sometimes it becomes a necessary thing for survival. And so we can speak legitimately of a conspiracy of light. It is very rare for such conspiracies to become politicized. It's very rare for God's people to get together and say, let's change the political order, even in the name of Jesus. And what mm -hmm. we are looking at now in 2 Kings um, 13 is one time out of the whole Old Testament that it did happen. And we're, we're noting the, the circumstances. First of all, Athaliah, the usurper, is on the throne. She has no claim whatsoever. Uh, she is uh, a Baal worshiper. Uh, Judah is a kingdom in covenant with God. She has completely rejected that and replaced Yahweh with, with Baal. She is a mass murderer. She's killed all the rightful heirs to the throne. She's got herself, as it were, elected without anyone actually voting for her. <clears throat> and she's continued a reign of terror for six years. And it's in this context, we began to see this last time, First of all, that Jehoshaphat, the princess, rescues one of the boys from the nursery, his name's Joab, or Joash, and <clears throat> brings him to the temple where she and her husband, who just happens to be the high priest, raise him in secrecy. At the end of that time, six years, in the seventh year, Jehoiada, the priest, basically says, enough is enough. Seven's close enough. Let's, let's make a change here. And so I it's read. It's kind of interesting that yeah. it is seven, not only that he's seven years old, but that they put up with the tyranny for six years and then the year of freedom <laughs> arrives, <laughs> in a sense. It would be interesting to try and trace it out and see if it actually was a Sabbath year or a Jubilee year. Uh, there is data for calculating such things, but I have never worked through it, so I have no idea. But certainly the number seven is significant. He does not try six, for instance. <clears throat> but <laughs> what he does do is to put out feelers. The past, the story is recorded again in um, Second Chronicles 23, I think it is, unfortunately. Anyhow, um, the accounts are not exactly the same, but they're close enough that we kind of can get an idea of what he did. He, he turned to the palace guard. Now, that's a little vague. Does that mean the palace guard that was actually protecting Athaliah? That, that's chancy. Does it mean the people who had been the palace guard before she took over and kicked them all out? That seems perhaps more likely, but we're not actually told. Of course, after seven years of serving for this woman, the current guard might be just as disaffected as the previous one. So anyway, he was working with the military, the people, the very people whose job it was to protect the lawful king or queen and, and gets them on board. He gets the head Levites on board and then sends out for more Levites. It may be that this was going to be a festival day because he's arranging for a lot of people to be there. And that might look suspicious if he weren't using some, some wisdom and sneakiness here. And then he also has his initial context go out into the cities of Judah and contact the patriarchs of the, of the tribe, the, the rulers of uh Jude and Benjamin and whatever tribes were, were still represented there, gets them on board. So this is not a one-man show. This is not uh, an assassination. This is not one or two people 
working behind the scenes to pull down the existing government. This is one man actively pulling together all of the lawful powers who could resist the queen and getting them to cooperate and agree that this is indeed what we're going to do because she's a tyrant, meaning she sees power unlawfully. She's wicked. She is a covenant breaker. She's a mass murderer. And we have the, we have the lawful heir here. And that's what happens next. He brings the, the leaders of this conspiracy of light together and shows them the king's son. And they see, oh, the boy's alive. We have the rightful heir. So having seen that, they decide, yeah, let's go for it. And I was beginning, I read about partway through the plan, which largely amounts to on the day, all of the Levites who had served the previous evening and should be going off, don't stay. All the Levites who are supposed to be coming in, come in. We'll have double the number of Levites. Hand them all of the weapons from the, the museum. The, the temple sometimes served as a museum for old weapons and things like the weapons that belonged to David. And besides, the Levites were supposed to be armed to protect the tem temple precincts. On top of that, the soldiers would be armed. So we're going to have an armed presence here representing the military, the um, political and social leaders, the patriarchs of the tribe, and the priests. So it's not going to be a very narrow, we're changing destiny, we're rewriting your history. You could thank us, but we're never going to tell you we did it kind of arrangement. This is a very public thing. Everybody who's included in it is making their part very public. And the charge is, you're guilty of treason. You have you are waging war on the covenant, however you want to say it, if you can even consider her. I guess by marriage, she's a, she's a member of the covenant. And they put this into, into practice. And I will read just the last bit here of what happens. Uh, this is uh, chapter 11 of 2 Kings. I'll pick up with verse 9. And the captains over the hundreds did according to all things that Jehoiada the priest commanded them. And they took every man his men that were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And to the captains over hundreds did the priests give King David spears and shields. And they were in the temple of the Lord. And the guard stood every man with his weapons in hand round about the king from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar of the temple. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony, uh, a copy of the law. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands, said, God save the king, or more literally, let the king live. Nathaliah heard the noise of the guard because the temple complex and the palace were conjoined closely. Uh, she hears the noise into the people. She came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was. We'll talk about that another time. And uh, the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, treason, treason. Uh-huh. But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the hosts, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges, and him that followed with her, kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way uh, by which the horses came into the king's house, and there she was slain. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people, and between the king also and the people. And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and broke it down. His altars, his images, break they in pieces thoroughly and slew Matt and the priest of Baal before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. He took rulers over hundreds and captains and the guard and all the people and brought down the king from the house of the Lord and came by the way of the gate of the guard to the king's house. And he sat on the throne of the kings and all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was in quiet, and they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. Seven years old was Jehovah when he began to reign. Well, we'll talk more about the whole covenanting together and such on another occasion. Uh, but the, the point here for Christians is what, what do we get out of this? This was no assassination attempt. There's nothing in Scripture that ever tells Christians Oh, your king, your president's a bad guy? Grab an assault rifle and take him out. 
So let's just say that right up front. We're not anarchists. We're not terrorists. We're not called to do that. It is not permitted to us. Rulers are put in place by God, and they need to be removed by God when they are extremely wicked. You know, God has channels and ways and means, but us acting as anarchists and revolutionaries and murderers is not the, is not it. I'm thinking of the teenagers I have to deal with uh, at school because so many of them have absorbed the American ethos of, oh, you're a bad guy, I should shoot you. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> there are some steps to take first. <laughs> there, there are. <laughs> and, and when all is said and done, you may not be the one pulling the trigger. In fact, there may, no, there may be no trigger to pull here. Um, there are different kinds of badness, and not all of them end in assa well, assassination or execution. So that, but coming out of the whole cowboy mythos um, mm. up through oh the Dirty Harry movies and 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 who knows well, all the all the television series, all the comic books, comic books, yeah, Batman, Superman. Um, where... I can think of specific assignments in your classes <laughs> <laughs> I bet make a lot more sense now. <laughs> Feel free. Uh, well, I don't want to spoil any anything for future members of your expository writing class. Oh, that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I actually do. Oh, he's a bad guy. So I shoot him. You what? Well, I shoot him. Okay. Roll the dice. No, oh, you killed him. Hmm. Uh, oddly enough, his partner is right behind you and pulls the trigger and you're dead now. What? Huh? What? And the young man came to you. But, but what? He was a bad guy and he killed him. What was wrong with that? Uh, you, you know, bad guys <laughs> come in more than one. <laughs> That's why there's an S at the yeah. end. <laughs> First, there's that. Secondly, you're not going to go around killing people just because they're bad. Yeah. Anyway, so... What we're talking about, what we begin talking about today, and what we'll talk about for the next few weeks, I think, is the place of covenant within the role of civil government. God establishes civil government by covenant. He delegates authority so that the civil magistrate acts in his name with his authority, so that when the civil government authorizes his agents to stop a fleeing murderer or uh, raised tanks and um, missiles against an invader, the magistrate is not guilty of murder. He has the authority to use deadly force to apprehend and punish criminals or to stop aggressive invaders. Mm. This is something he gets from God. Now, can he use it because there are a bunch of children outside his window being way too noisy? Can he just have them all <laughs> shot? No, <laughs> because that's not within the scope of God's law. And so with this uh, delegated authority comes a transcript of righteousness. Here is your job. Here is the standard by which you rule. Here, here are the rules you enforce. And, and God hands these out. Some of them have to be amplified in terms of current conditions and such. But the basic morality is there in Scripture, and, and the magistrate needs to observe it. Yeah. At now, some point it becomes, are you keeping your word? You know, it's not like God gave the rules of the state of California to the state of California. No. Um, we're, we're not suggesting that. But at some point there's the basic morality also of playing by the rules that you've set up, keeping your word in that no. sense. And those rules mm. should adhere to the justice that's revealed in God's word. Yeah. God says, thou shalt not kill. The civil government, in fact, it goes further and says, keep your property safe by not leaving open ditches or goring oxen or mm -hmm. your um, the top of your roof without battlements. From there, we can logically deduce that we should keep our property safe. Public property should be safe. Roads should be safe. <laughs> we should not drive all this whatever direction we want to whenever we want to. <laughs> that kills people. And it's not so, about putting fences on top of our roofs. No. <laughs> that is an example that was good for their time. We put uh, banisters on staircases and around swimming pools. 
But there are other ways by which we ought to keep our property safe. We do not need something in Scripture that says, and verily thou shalt drive on the right side of the road unless you live on a small <laughs> island off the coast of France. Um, <laughs> these are things where God gives us authority to figure out how to make our property safe and how to honor thou shalt not kill in such circumstances. Uh, but the man who swears to uphold God's law and the applicatory laws that people have devised since then is on its basis, has made a promise, as you say. He's made a commitment. This, this, these are the laws I'm going to enforce. Having made those, he doesn't get to violate them because, well, I'm the governor or I'm the president or I'm a Supreme Court judge. He not only has to obey, obey the traffic laws, he has to obey ca campaign finance laws and a whole host of other mm -hmm. laws, ca campaign and voting integrity laws, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and, and if he doesn't, then he faces consequences, and that's the fourth part of a covenant. And the magistrate should enforce the consequences of a covenant, but he himself is open to consequences when he does not uphold the laws he's sworn to enforce. And that's what we come back to. Okay, so what do we do? Well, in a, in a wonderful system, as the American system was designed to be, you have these three branches of government existing at at least two or three levels, federal, state, county, sometimes city, uh, where there's always someone to act as a check and balance. The Congress can impeach a president. The Supreme Court can declare uh, a law of Congress unconstitutional, and so forth. Um, the states can call on the federal government to get its act together. Uh, a local governor can uh, put a check on a federal marshal. These are things that are inherent in the American system. And although it's very complicated, it's not thereby a bad thing. It allows for someone to make an appeal to. There's always someone you could run to who at least has a good chance of sheltering you from evil or at least giving you time to make your cause known to the public. And of course, in America, in theory, we the people are the authority to whom things can be appealed. That and a whole tradition of common law. Well, and also, uh, the compl complicated nature of it is to the benefit of both parties. Because mm -hmm. not only can you s stop someone else from doing something that's ne not necessarily uh, in keeping with the promises you've made, not in keeping with common law or natural law or God's law, you your actions can also be yes. held up. It's it's everyone everyone has something that can stick a wrench into the works <laughs> and stop you from doing a bad thing, even good things. I mean, like you were saying, the the government has the right and the authority from God to raise up armies and to direct funds in particular ways, and a lot of the time those can be very good. You still want you basically need a system that allows everyone to come together and say, okay, actually, this is a good thing to use our money on. Right. For a certain definition of everyone. <laughs> I mean, we, we everyone need in representation. In the, uh, right? Everyone, yes, but in terms of their representatives. And so yes. the president, by our constitution, which is not universal law, but it's a good example of one way to apply God's law. Our president has to go back to Congress every two years and ask for funds to maintain any war he's involved in. He himself cannot declare war unless we are actually uh, attacked or invaded. So this yeah, puts some damage. Funny how many upon. wars we have not declared in the past seventy years. Yeah, we kind of <laughs> lost that one Loophole. Um, after World War II, I guess. Uh, let's uh, here's how to fight a war: not call it one, and everything's great. <laughs> Here's how to get away with uh, running a pyramid scheme. Don't call it a pyramid scheme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pyramid schemes are illegal. Yes, but this isn't. And we're not illegal, so we can't be a pyramid scheme. Exactly. Right. Well, because of this complicated nature of things, when God's people cannot put up or feel they cannot put up with particular travesties of justice, or simply when they say, you know, this is not promising, really somebody should do this. We have a whole host of things open to us as Americans. Not everybody in the whole world has this. We can write petitions. We can write letters to our representatives. We can picket. We can assemble and, and do rallies. 
Uh, we can file uh, cases in lower courts that may reach higher courts. There's a lot of things that we can do that are not only completely lawful, they're actually encouraged by the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And this, this in itself is a good thing. You, and it is possible even to call a, an elected official, challenge him and say, look, you don't have the right. I'm going to see you in court, mm -hmm. which is not far from Paul's I appeal to Caesar. Mm -hmm. Americans are often loath to um, push their constitutional rights with the excuse that, well, that's mixing church and state. No, you, you, you live as a Christian in a political state to which you have responsibilities. One is to uphold the justice of the thing, of the system you're in. There's nothing wrong about pursuing and prosecuting your rights to the extent of the law. And sometimes that might make a little colorful. You know, it's funny when I, I read a lot of British detective novels, and one thing that keeps coming across is, oh, we'd never have the Bobbies at our house. <laughs> that is such a non-American idea. Why not? I, want, I love the police to stop by my house. I do not have a problem. There may be a day when that will change. But right now, and if now, they come inside, they better be invited or have a warrant. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. And and the the men and women who I know who are police officers or sheriff's officers would. So it, it, getting entangled, if that's the word, with such people, should not be a problem to us. Uh, the, these are lawful things that we can do, and there. And again, I go back to Paul's I appeal to Caesar. Mm. Um, the, the first time he he got into trouble with a um, a local government, they beat him up, and afterwards he thought apparently, wait, <laughs> there was a card I forgot to play. <laughs> this, this, this was in Philippi, and the magistrates didn't say, oh, he said, tell the jailer, all right, let him go. We just get get him out of here. And Paul has figured out by now. No, that's not. No, that's this is not how this should have happened. So he says, uh, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned being Romans, and will they now slip us out of town? I don't think so. Have them come down here and by with their own little tender hands, release us. <laughs> <laughs> publicly, that, with an apology. Yeah, public, with an apology. Yeah. And the magistrates, when they find out that these guys are Romans, say, oh boy, violating the rights of a Roman citizen could get you killed in very unpleasant ways. Uh, and so they come and do that. Well, this is not Paul being vindictive. This is Paul saying they've messed with God's representatives, with with the spokesman of the gospel once. They'll do it again unless we smack them on the snout and say, watch it, because you never know when you're dealing with a Roman citizen. And I imagine the church in Philippi got a lot of room from then on out because they <laughs> did not know who in that group might be a Roman. So they didn't mess without real good reason and real good evidence. Paul was, and from then on, as we go through the book of Acts, we find Paul using the card a lot quicker when he's about mm -hmm. to be examined, uh, examined um, by a, a Roman centurion. He he pulls the card real fast. Is it lawful for you to beat a man uncondemned and a Roman? And the, the centurion drops the cords and immediately goes and finds the captain. And says, uh, "Be careful, this guy's a Roman." As soon as the captain comes and talks to him, he realizes, oh, he is? Let him go. Let him go right now. He's a Roman and he, he knows his rights. He knows his rights. <laughs> Paul was not afraid to do this. There's nothing wrong here. He's not mixing church and state in any unlawful or ungodly way. He is using what God has provided to promote the gospel. Well, it's it's interesting, too, because there's been an argument I've seen um I only remember seeing it in, in the past six months or so, but it's possible that other people were using it before then. And it's basically, oh, well, we're Christians. And Paul said you have to give up your rights uh, as Christians, so we ought to um, give up our rights to guns because no, that's it makes not other what people uncomfortable. About. Oh, that's terrible. People are and, saying that? <laughs> oh, yes. I've seen at least a dozen different people make that claim who are supposedly <laughs> believers. But I, I can believe that. It, I can believe they're believers, believers but <laughs> that they're intelligent is something else again. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That, that they're thinking things through, at least. That yeah, I feel because like they've actually that, read the verses in context. Yeah. <laughs> no, I feel like that was thought about it for texted. themselves for two seconds. Well, yeah. 
Well, perhaps we should, so having thoroughly criticized this position, I guess we should actually address yeah. it exegetically. Yeah. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul spends a lot of time showing us that the gospel takes, and forwarding the gospel, and the the fruit of the gospel in my Christian brother is more important than me getting everything I am personally entitled to. And so, if on the first level, if me enjoying something that I have a right to, Paul doesn't actually use the words rights, but it's probably the word that we would use. Then, then this thing that I might, for instance, I enjoy pepperoni pizza. Well, if I have a friend who thinks that pork is wrong and he does so for what he perceives to be biblical reasons, one, he's wrong, but two, okay, until we, until we can talk this over, um, I should not unnecessarily offend him, particularly though the word offend in this context means cause him to stumble. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't lead him into pork. sin. <laughs> yes. peer, peer, I, I should not be imposing peer pressure to get him to come and eat my pepperoni when I know he thinks it's sinful. And you can insert anything else here that you like. Uh, beer or wine, uh, going to the theater, playing cards, dancing, are all kinds of things where Christians have scruples. And sometimes you can see why they might, given the history of a particular practice or who it's often associated with. Um, and, and, and it is for us to say, okay, well, since you, since you have this scruple, since you think this is wrong and you think you have biblical grounds, and I don't need to do it right now for any good reason, I'm going to pass on it. I'm not going to try to peer pressure you into doing this thing that you think are wrong. We'll talk about something else. We'll go someplace else. We'll engage some other activity. And maybe some other time we could talk about this, or maybe it's not even that important. Uh, uh, maybe I'm not going to see you that much. Maybe just we'll, we'll, we'll let it drop here and leave this to God. On, on a more pressing level, Paul takes that further to say that when we are living out the Christian life, we need to be like the Olympic athlete who denies himself all kinds of morally lawful pleasures so that we can win the prize. And the message there to every Christian is there are things that slow me down, slow you down, that may not slow anybody else in the world down. Things that get in the way of my faith, of my obedience, that are a problem for me, and they may not be at all for you. There may be in them nothing wrong at all in general, but for me, they're a problem. And if that's the case, then for the sake of the cross, for the sake of the gospel, I may need for a time or permanently, to lay them aside so that they do not trip me up or they don't trip anyone else up. So that's the context there. The idea that I need to resign all my civil rights because there are people out there who hate them is ridiculous. <laughs> not what he's talking about. And yeah. in fact, in, in the long run, uh, antithetical because it is those rights which guard the health and safety of my Christian friend. Well, and and think about it too. In the American context, the the same people who make that argument that I brought up, they would never use it on another right and say like, "Well, Paul said we have to give up our rights if it furthers the gospel. So if you want to reach the neo Nazi down the street, you should give up your right to equal pay and opportunity and uh, existence in society and not having to use separate water fountains." So that you can reach them, because you don't want to make them stumble based on you having equal access to things. Yeah, they would never do that. We hope. <laughs> we hope. Oh, that's yeah, a good our generation, yours, has seen the most bizarre things in the name of love and justice. Things that my generation was like, oh, no one would ever think of that one. They're happening, <laughs> and it's just it's for mm -hmm. us older folk to look there with our mouths falling open, saying, "You've got to be." It's not that we didn't know that man was this sinful; it's just we'd never seen it lived out before in any place yeah. but history books on you know the decline and fall of the Roman Empire or the destruction <laughs> of Pompeii or something like that. Uh, that um, postmodern man in the twenty first century would fall back into these. These moral horrors, it's just mm. it takes away your breath and makes you wonder if you are, you've shifted over to an alternate universe. Anyway, so there's a thing. There is one last thing, and that brings us back to Jehoiada. 
There may be times, and the word may is really important here. It's, there's a may, uh, there's there's two levels of mayness. <laughs> the may of it may be this bad. And if it if it actually is this bad, then you may need to seek this remedy. There is no necessity here. Just because the civil government is really awful does not mean that we have to move to this next step. Well, first of all, how bad is bad? Right now, this America's civil government looks awfully bad. I don't think anyone would put it on the level of Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler yet. Well, no, I take that back. Some people put it on the level of Joseph <laughs> Stalin and Adolf Hitler, but not not the vast majority yet, yeah. I should think. And I and think we have to we would encourage that person to read a little bit more about Adolf Hitler and Joseph yeah, Stalin. Yeah, you need to know your history a little bit better than assuming uh that some this is drastic and something drastic has to happen now. Have we tried these other things? For instance, has your church engaged in weekly prayer for your civil rulers? so that we can lead lives of quietness and righteousness before God. Mm. If we haven't done that, then probably any step beyond that that's that's particularly um, violent probably needs to go on the back shelf for a while. God has given us means, and one of the chief ones is prayer. Yeah, yeah maybe not, before we do things that we think God might have maybe called us to do, we should do the things that he explicitly told us yeah, to do. Yeah, that he explicitly <laughs> told us to do, and the one thing... The two things he commands us with regard to civil government is obey and pray. Mm -hmm. So we should not be obnoxious. We should not be rude. We should not slander officials. We can speak the truth, but we don't have to do it in biting sarcasm or four-letter words. Or outright and, falsehoods. All right, outright falsehood, exaggerations, whatever. And and then we need to pray for these people and pray for them um, in, in the totality of who they are. Uh, my uh, pastor at my previous church used to regularly pray for the the health, well-being, and safety of the man who was our president at the time. The man who was a president at the time was not a nice guy, and he was certainly not a friend of Christianity, and yet pastor hardly ever failed to miss that one in his weekly prayers in the church. So far that I remember one man objecting, why does he always have to pray for that guy? Because that guy's our president. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, secondly, we need to do. Do we have? Do we have other people, other men and women, who have been appointed by God, whether by hereditary succession or popular vote or whatever system your country uses, to positions of authority? In other words, in addition to your president, king, prime minister, are there judges? Are there members of parliament? Are there uh, legislatures? Are there uh, sheriffs? sheriffs? Um, how about these people? Are they willing to take a stand? They too have been appointed to enforce God's law. Yeah. Are there lawful things within the system that they can do uh, without necessarily jumping immediately to armed rebellion? Can they simply say, no, we're not enforcing that here? Um, can they refuse to cooperate? Can they say, you can make the rule, we're not enforcing it? And the refusal to enforce would be on the basis of a rule's being unlawful. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. thing is- It's not is just because they didn't like no, it. it's not because we don't like it. That thing is unconstitutional. And yeah. therefore, it would be wrong for us to enforce it because we are, we have sworn to uphold the Constitution just as you have. So you want to make you want to fight over this? I'll see you in civil court. Mm. Um, there are those possibilities. At the far end of all of these may and may nots, we get to the final one of: Is the guy who is making himself a tyrant is he ready to wage war on his own people? Is he ready to shut down churches by force? Is he willing to round up people and put them in concentration camps? Is he willing to machine gun whole groups of people meeting in public protest? Is he making himself the law of the land beyond criticism or um, rebuke? When you get such a man, then maybe it's time, and there's the maybe, maybe it's time to 
encourage or get behind one of these judges, sheriffs, um, prime ministers, prelates, whatever, somebody with some kind of authority in general who wants to stand for the laws of the land, for the constitution of the nation, whatever sort it may be, for the law of God, and say, yeah, you are, you have become an enemy. You have become the very sort of person you swore to oppose, yeah. and the sort of person we swore to oppose. So, you may step down, or we will apply violence with extreme prejudice. Now, as you look over the history of the Christian West, that kind of thing has not happened very, very often. There have been times when nations have gone to war, each claiming to serve Jesus in some fashion. But within a nation, there have not been that many times when a self-consciously Christian group of people have got together and said, we are in a position of lawful authority. We have we've gone through the hoops. We've done the the petitions, the protests, calling in the favors. We've done everything lawful that we can, and you will not listen. And now military action becomes necessary. Within our own uh, Anglo-Saxon tradition, I guess you would say, there's the um, the English Civil Wars, mm -hmm. the Glorious Revolution, and the American War for Independence. And in each case, there was a lawful authority trying, have, having not been able to get along with the king on other terms, saying, we've tried, we've asked, we've, we've, we've got, tried to get people to intercede. You will not listen. And so it's time for us to go our way, and we don't want a war, but we will fight one if necessary. And this is a tradition of, of freedom and liberty, of patriotism, of boldness, of self-sacrifice, and it is not one to enter into lightly because people die. And the people who die may be your son, your brother, your uncle, your grandson, your friend, your, you know, it goes down the list. War is not something that Christians want to rush into. We want to avoid it. Even war for the sake of Jesus, because that's the last straw. That's when we've tried everything else. And when the freedom of the gospel is actually at stake, and, and yet sometimes, rarely, it may be lawful. The problem with Americans is we think all, all a lot of Americans just heard is, oh, I can go pull my gun and shoot people. No. <laughs> not <laughs> no, that's not what it. we're saying. That's not what we're saying. The Declaration of Independence frames some of these ideas in these words. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guardians for their future security. In every stage of these oppressions, we've petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. Nor have we been, have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We've warned them, we've reminded them, we've appealed, we've conjured them. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, and you know the rest. But notice how long it took. Mm -hmm. uh, the first shots of the war, April 18th, 1775, at least that's when Paul Revere did his famous ride. It was not until July uh, 4th, 1776, a year later, that our founding fathers finally said, um, we're not, we can't make this work. They spent a year with petitions. They spent a year actually fighting before they really said, we need to leave and do this on our own. They were not in a hurry, mm -hmm. and they were very conscious about dotting every I, crossing every T. And this is something the American people have lost. We, we again, mm -hmm. I keep coming back to this, but we we have this idea that when we push, we've, we've been pushed, we get to push back right away. This is not the spirit of Christ. No. These are extreme cases, 
extreme measures for extreme danger to our future, to our church, uh, and to our children. Mm -hmm. But it is there just maybe in case. Yeah. Well, I think we have to stop there. I'm sure we could talk a lot more about this, but it is time to wrap up with some recommendations. Yes. Well, I'll recommend um, Vindicii Contra Tyrannis, or the English yeah. title, A Defense of Liberty Against Tyrants. It was published under the pen name of Junius and Brutus. I'm sure you can find a copy someplace, Defense of Liberty Against Tyrants, which runs through some of these arguments and supplies a good deal of biblical background along the way. It's a much it's a much easier read than Sam Rutherford's Lex Rex, um, <laughs> because it was a popular rah-rah track for the times and was very popular, John Adams says, on the eve of the American Revolution. Uh, and it's, it's very not, short, isn't it's it? It's very short. Yeah, yeah, it's it's easy to read. But if you want to think about this some more, here's a good starting point. Yeah. I'd like to recommend Eric Metax's biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm. I last read it when I was a junior in high school, so I'd like to read it again. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been through a lot since I was a junior in high school. <laughs> but it, the conversation reminded me a lot of his story. And I think when it comes to time management or <laughs> budgeting or what you would do in the case of a tyrant, I think there's a principle that's sort of an extension of Jesus saying, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. Uh, mm -hmm. To him who has, more will be given. Of Asking yourself, what would I do in these extreme circumstances? You can find some of that answer in what you're doing now. Mm whatever those circumstances are. And maybe some of those circumstances are extreme, but you kind of have to wait and see. Only time can tell some of that. But yeah, I, I think Bonhoeffer has a really interesting story and it's one of those few people that we can point to as saying, oh, he was a Christian and participated in an assassination. <laughs> That's really strange. That's really unusual. And it's unusual because of everything that we talked about. Yeah. Um, so it's especially worth noting. There's this moment in history where Bonhoeffer is a pastor pretending to be a spy, pretending to be a pastor, and he really just <laughs> wants to be a pastor. And it's, it's really great. <laughs> okay. Brian. Uh, speaking of conspiracies, I am going to recommend Guards, Guards by Terry Pratchett, <laughs> the late, great Sir Terry Pratchett. One of the subplots, or actually, well, it's kind of a subplot, but it feeds into the main plot of the book is that there is a conspiracy of people led by someone we don't know who yet early on in the book but you find out later and they're trying to overthrow the um the what's his name the, the patrician who is the ruler <laughs> of the the main city and um i i pulled up this quote because i i couldn't find the quotes from when the mysterious conspiracist group is actually meeting they have all, the, all these words that they go through and it's something like you know have the doors of infinity been well and truly shut they have brother so and so <laughs> have the ravens of eternity uh had their beaks shackled shut yes they have brother <laughs> you know it's all this stuff they have to do and go through before they can start their meeting but one of them is looking for a place. They're in like the, the shady side of town. And there's this exchange, which I will read shortly, uh, between the door guard and the person who wishes to enter. The significant owl hoots in the night. <laughs> Yet many gray lords go sadly to the masterless men. Hooray, hooray for the spinster's sister's daughter. To the axemen, all supplicants are the same height. <laughs> Yet, verily, the rose is within the thorn. The good mother makes bean soup for the errant boy. What? The good mother makes bean soup for the errant boy. Are you sure the ill-built tower doesn't tremble mightily at a butterfly's passage? Nope. Bean soup it is. I'm sorry. What about the caged whale? What about it? It should know nothing of the mighty deeps, if you must know. <laughs> oh, the caged whale. You want the elucidated brethren of the ebon knight. Three doors down. <laughs> 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 
and pretty much every page has something funny because it's Terry Pratchett. So you'll you'll go away very entertained. <laughs> and it's called again what? Guards, 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 guards. Okay. Uh, and that is the first book in the Discworld series, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it is the first book in the uh, Night Watch series. I believe oh, Color okay. of Magic is the first Discworld series. Oh, okay. I think he has like four or five different series within the main the, the world that he does and i i've never been able to keep track of which came first cool. i may have to order this that was that was <laughs> worth it right there <laughs> <laughs> All right. well thank you so much for this conversation it's been a delight thank you so much to david our producer and my lawfully wedded husband thank you to our listeners we appreciate you tuning in uh, thank you especially to our financial supporters you keep the show rolling uh, if you'd like to join their number, by the way, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. You can always get in touch with us by emailing us at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. And you can follow us on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, question mark. Yeah, Facebook and uh, any of your favorite podcast catchers. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you.